I'm Dr. Greg Ellis, and I want to talk today about very important things related to weight control. There's two issues. One is something called metabolic adaptations, and the other is what I call the metabolic control of food intake. We'll address the metabolic adaptations in another video. In this video, I want to concentrate on the metabolic control of food intake. So what, what's that saying? Now, I am a believer in the calories in, calories out theory, and that controls your body weight. And it's important to understand that the body does not monitor the amount of calories that go into your mouth. It monitors the amount of calories that the body burns. So calories have two fates. The food energy has two different fates. It can either be burned for energy or it can be stored. This is called the metabolic control of food intake. So what the body's actually monitoring in its determination of your appetite and your hunger is how, how many calories are actually being burned in the active tissues, your muscles and your organs. Because if calories are stored away in the fat tissue, they can't be burned. It can't be accessed. And this is a major issue. And that will drive hunger and appetite. Now, people eat for a lot of different reasons, but ultimately, it's hunger and appetite that drive it. And if you're eating when you're not hungry, that's going to be a big issue. But ultimately, appetite and hunger control the amount of food that you eat, and that's what we have to be concerned about. This is also called fuel partitioning drives the fuel into the tissues. So the, if the active tissues are, are being fed, if they're getting the energy they need, then they will not send feeding signals to the brain. And that won't drive hunger, so you won't experience a lot of hunger. On the other hand, if the calories you consume get stored in your fat tissue, then there is not that much food energy in your blood and that blood lacking energy will be bathing all the active tissues of your body and they won't get anything. So collectively they'll send a feeding signal to the brain driving you, the animal, to eat. And you will obey those biological signals because you figure, well, I'm hungry, therefore I can eat. But you don't understand that that hunger is arising because food is not being burned in the active tissues. So this is kind of confusion that creates a lot of problems for people. Now, the issue of diet composition. Scientists have studied what they call the high-fat diet for years and years and years and argue that it is the high-fat diet that has caused the obesity epidemic. But it turns out the high-fat diet that has been studied all these years is a diet that is high in both fat and high in carbohydrates. That's a deadly, deadly composition. This is also known as a supermarket diet. So we know that that will happen. So why is it that this diet leads to such level of obesity? Well, it's primarily because carbohydrates drive the direction that food's going to take, whether it goes to storage or whether it goes to burning. And it's the glucose, the end product of carbohydrate digestion, that determines where this food's going to go. Now, hormones affect what the glucose does, like the hormone insulin, potentiates the uptake of glucose into the fat cell. Glucose is rapidly converted into body fat, and insulin potentiates that effect. And this process, the primary enzymes and hormones that drive this process are insulin and glucagon. Insulin is a pancreatic hormone, and it primary role is to slow the release of fat from the fat cell. But then it also augments the uptake of glucose into the fat cell. Now when glucose and fat are both present, the glucose is driven into the fat cell, away from burning, and the fat that you've eaten rides right along with it. So now you're storing both the glucose and the fat in your fat cell. And this is going to drive hunger which is going to drive overeating. Now we know from many studies that have been done that the storage of fuel always precedes you eating more. In other words, the, the eating more doesn't occur first. It's the storage of fuel that occurs first. 
and then you overeat. And this has been demonstrated in 143 different studies. So the work began years ago by several really good researchers, some right here in Philadelphia, and they determined this and called this the metabolic control of food intake. So that's the important point to remember here that fuel that is stored cannot be burned. And it's primarily carbohydrate that drives this process. And it stimulates enzymes, the glucose and the insulin, stimulates enzymes that take the glucose and convert it into body fat and divert it away from being burned in the active tissues. Now what happens to someone who loses weight? Primarily the people, the diet that's been used over the years has been the low fat diet to re weight reduce people. And the body now is geared because they're eating a low fat diet, which means it's high in carbohydrate. They're going to be geared to store those calories as fat in the fat cell and not burn them. So staying on a low fat, low fat diet and having lost weight is a death blow for a low fat person because they're just going to be ravenously hungry all the time. So if they've lost 10 or 15 or 20 pounds, the hunger drives are going to be brutal and they're going to overeat. And if they don't understand the reason why this is happening, they're never going to succeed at losing the weight they want. So this brings into play the low carbohydrate diet. And that is a diet that is higher in fat, but low in carbohydrate. But you can't mix the two. You can't have carbohydrates and fats together. That's just the worst. The supermarket diet is the worst. So we're getting to a point now where we understand this. I wrote all this up in my 2002 book, Ultimate Diet Secrets, detailed all the specifics of this whole relationship. Now, the other ma major driver of hunger is what kind of changes you experience when you lose weight. So if you lose weight, generally, 25% of that is going to be lean tissue. That's organs and muscle and 75% will be fat tissue. And this varies, of course, along the, the body weight, body fat continuum. The percentages change. But as you deplete your fat mass, you get very, very hungry because the body wants to return to where it was. And the only way you can overcome this hunger drive is to keep your carbohydrate intake low, which allows fuel to remain in the blood. So, Obesity occurs because we're storing all this extra fat in our fat cell being driven by the glucose and the carbohydrates. The calories still control because you'll tend to overeat if you're at a party, you know, a picnic, whatever. You'll just eat and you lose all control. But this is a biological way of controlling your body and your body fat levels by using a low carbohydrate diet. Now this doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get lean because we have seen for many, many years people following a low carbohydrate diet will lose weight and there's been all kinds, and the Atkins diet has been probably the, the most famous and most people who do a low carb diet follow his regimen. It's, it's full of flaws but it's the one that's used most often. But I know and Many of us know from having worked with people who follow the Atkins protocol that there is some initial early success that's rather dramatic in some people that could lose 30, 40, 50 pounds. But for most people, they lose 5 or 10 pounds and they hit a wall. And now it's important that you begin to monitor your calorie intake. That's the only way you can push further because the low-carb diet by itself will not reduce your food intake enough to help you reach your weight loss goals. So that's how this is all controlled. And it's important that you understand that and then you make the adjustments in your diet accordingly. Now, in my book, I spell exactly how to do the low carb diet correctly. And you, don't, you do not want to follow the Atkins protocol. It's much too difficult and it also requires too much of a reduction in the carbohydrate grams that you eat each day. And that's difficult for most people to do. So they go on low-carb diet. They last for a couple of weeks to a month or two, and then they start eating 
again, and then they go back to carbohydrate-loaded diets, and now we turn on. In fact, it's already turned on. All the enzymes in your, in your cells are revved up as a result of having lost weight, and they want to gobble up now any carbohydrates they see and convert them into body fat. So that's how that process works. That's why it's so difficult for people to maintain their lost weight. So you've got to use biology and not willpower to succeed at the weight loss game. And it's a combination of all these factors. So calories in, calories out still are the controlling factor, but the metabolic control of food intake is very, very important. And low-fat diets won't work for the very reason that they are typically high in carbohydrate, and that's going to cause fat storage. So you have to overcome that. We have to get away from this craziness of all these low-fat diets that we're on. Everybody's still recommending low-fat. And very few people have caught on to the power of restricted carbohydrate eating. And it's important that we, that we do that. So that's what I wanted to cover today, metabolic control of food intake. And then we'll come back and we're going to look at the changes that occur in your body as you lose weight called metabolic adaptations, which you have to understand. And this determines calorie needs and calorie intake, and it's all related to how your tissues change, how your lean body mass changes and how your fat mass changes. Uh, the loss of fat mass is, in fact, one of the most powerful drivers of hunger and appetite. And you get people who get down to 5 10% body fat. That fat mass just wants to come roaring back. So that's going to drive hunger like crazy. So we'll come back to that in another video. It's Dr. Greg Ellis.